Hello, my name is Fari Hahak, and I'm the director of Middlebury in DC. In light of current events, this interview is the first in a series of interviews about careers in public health and is part of the MidVantage program. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Pam Berenbaum. Pam is the director of the Global Health Program and professor of the practice of global health at Middlebury College. She is a member of the leadership team for the Engaged Learning Centers. She has taught at Middlebury since 2010, teaching courses on global health, public health policy, and disaster public health. Pam holds a Master's of Science in Health Policy and Management from Harvard University School of Public Health. She has worked in many sectors, including government, academic, consulting, and nonprofit. For 10 years, she was an infectious disease epidemiologist in the Vermont Department of Health, where she specialized in syndromic surveillance, bioterrorism, and all hazards emergency preparedness collaborating with personnel from other state agencies, as well as the CDC. Welcome, Pam. Good morning. Good morning. Pam, could you lay out what the public health industry is like and the different types of careers that are available in the industry? Sure. Um, the, the field of public health is completely interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary and happens at many different levels of um, society and government and organization. So this is really the ultimate team sport. You know, we need lots of different backgrounds. So at its most uh, sort of local level, um, there are public health workers, you know, on the ground working with communities. And at this point, actually, I should just interject that public health is really about the health of populations or groups of people, whereas medicine is concerned with the health of an individual. So in public health, we're always trying to increase the baseline level of health in a community. So some of that work takes place on the ground in local communities. And then as you sort of zoom out from the local level, then you get levels of government involved, um, larger NGOs, but the work takes place at all sorts of levels from both um, health promotion, like might be a vac uh, immunization campaign, for instance, and then way out at the policy level, uh, where we might be concerned with agricultural subsidies and how that impacts people's access to food. So for instance, in Vermont, where I live, there's one public health jurisdiction, which is the Vermont Department of Health, and they have local presences, about one per county. And so they work on all sorts of uh, public health initiatives. They might refer people for HIV testing. They might run, uh, they all run WIC programs, women, infants, mm -hmm. and children. So supplemental nutrition, um, all sorts of programs, emergency preparedness. And then that work that happens at the state level happens locally, but is funded through both the state budget and grants from the CDC. So, um, and then the work is also guided by national guidelines, mostly developed by CDC or perhaps DHHS. So then the state is reporting up to the Centers for Disease Control, which is the public health authority for the United States. And is uh, part, it's actually part of Homeland Security now, so it's part of the federal government. And um, so that's just sort of the view within the United States. And what I haven't mentioned is all the work being done by social service agencies that are perhaps not working on health directly, or sometimes they are, but they are helping to work on what we call the social determinants of health. So people have difficulty living a healthy life if, for instance, they're experiencing violence in the home, or they experience food insecurity, or their housing is not stable, or they don't have um, a good enough education to get a well-paying job you know, and pay their bills. So people need all of those social supports to live a healthy life. And lots of local nonprofits work on those other things. You know, they might, for instance, help people overcome an addiction. So although those locally operating nonprofits are not part of the State Department of Health, they're doing really important work that I consider public health and that um, is necessary for public health to succeed. And then if we look at the international picture, um, public health looks very different in a lot of places. In this country and in lots of the sort of, you know, um, industrialized capitalist parliamentary democracies, um, 
that are very wealthy countries, there's a whole separate public health infrastructure that's different from the healthcare infrastructure or from medicine. And in more resource poor countries, there often is not enough of a tax base to support a public health infrastructure. So public health initiatives get folded into healthcare. Um, but again, there are hundreds of millions of people in the world who have never been to a doctor, never seen a dentist. So some countries have some pretty dire medical health needs and also public health needs. You know, people don't have access to clean water, for instance. So in more resource poor areas, a lot of the public health promotion work is carried out by nonprofits. They can be little tiny ones. They can be huge, massive international NGOs. And the larger NGOs and INGOs get a lot of contract work and funding from places like the World Bank, the IMF, uh, perhaps UNICEF, who um, develop the very broad, long range goals for population health and then uh, provide funding that they'll contract out to local governments, to local nonprofits, to national, international NGOs. And the work all gets carried out through this very complex patchwork quilt of players and organizations, some local, some national, some international. How do you see the current pandemic uh, changing uh, the public health industry? Um, I think that the current pandemic is going to change quite a few things. Um, one thing that I actually hope that it changes is the willingness of traditional allopathic medicine to um, embrace telehealth, which looks kind of like what we're doing right now, you know, where if you were my doctor and I had a complaint, we might have a video call. And then maybe you'll prescribe me a medication or, or maybe you'll ask for, for me to come into the office so you can examine me. But um, in this country, the field of medicine has not really embraced telehealth. But telehealth works really well for a lot of people. People that don't have access to transportation or who don't feel comfortable driving or in Vermont, you know, where it could snow seven months out of the year. <laughs> a lot of people don't want to drive in the snow. Um, you know, for behavioral health, uh, it helps some people with highly stigmatized conditions. And so I'm hoping that, you know, we're all realizing that we can have really powerful and effective um, interactions virtually. So I think that that might help that. I think that the pandemic is um, really bringing into sharper focus the many inequalities that exist, not only in our society, but globally. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we've all been reading lots of articles or, or also have friends and neighbors who are, um, you know, we've, there are a lot of people who cannot just quarantine themselves in their house. You know, there are people being laid off or there are people whose jobs require them to be out in public. You know, people driving buses, people working in, in the checkout counters in grocery stores, and these tend to be lower paying jobs. And so all of those folks are going to work every day to make our lives healthy and possible. And so there's a lot of discussion about that. And, and inequalities are always of huge importance in public health because health outcomes are closely linked to inequalities. And outside of this country, other countries have even greater inequalities than we do. And the pandemic has mostly hit uh, wealthier nations up to now. Um, you know, China, the United States, Europe, um, and when the pandemic hits poorer countries in full force, so, you know, countries in sub-Saharan Africa who already have some of the worst um, life expectancies and health outcomes in the world, I'm really afraid and concerned about what the pandemic is going to do in those countries um, that have very weak healthcare systems in some places, not, not everywhere, but, um, this particular disease, when it strikes severely, it requires very intensive levels of nursing and very advanced equipment in a pretty high-tech hospital with negative pressure rooms. And a lot of countries just don't have hospitals that have you know, such 
uh, equipment and trained personnel. And also in many parts of the world, people are um, very sick all the time. They might be malnourished chronically. They might get malaria four or five times a year. They might be HIV positive. They might have tuberculosis. So then when you fold in a severe respiratory disease on top of those underlying health conditions, it's, it's potentially really devastating. And so I'm hoping that the pandemic um, will remind us that there's still a lot of work to be done and that um, there, there are important ways that we can give money and funding and effort to help provide more equitable access to healthcare throughout the world. And um, I think I have sort of a long list here about what the pandemic might do, but I think another thing that, um, that I hope will happen as a result of the pandemic is that we'll all be reminded how, of how important science is and communicating science. With a novel virus, there are key critical scientific questions that we have to answer in order to treat people, in order to protect people, in order to know when we can reopen the economy. And the scientific minutia are absolutely critical. And so we need people doing the science, we need people communicating the science, and scientists aren't always great at communicating their science, but we need to really, as a society and, and as a world, you know, increase our ability to understand scientific information and translate it into policy. And I feel like that it's never been more important. And you know, for example, the confusion over masks. There's different types of masks. When should we wear them? Who should wear them? What should they be made out of? Why does it matter? If I wear a mask, Am I protecting myself or am I protecting you? These are all completely scientific questions. And, um, and I feel like recently there's been um, a de-emphasis of science with regard to policymaking. And I think this pandemic is showing us that we need science more than ever. And I guess finally, I would say that, um, and this is a bit on a lighter note, I'm hoping that people will be reminded that they can cook, <laughs> that anybody can learn how to cook. You know, especially in our country, we have such a takeout and restaurant and fast food oriented culture. And it's no coincidence that we also have a type two diabetes and obesity epidemic. And people are not eating out and people are shopping for groceries and they're Googling recipes and I hope that um, people are realizing that they can save a lot of money and they can eat more nutritious foods and have less food waste by actually cooking their own food at home. And maybe even, you know, getting kids interested in cooking. Most kids are not in school. Um, and I know my kids have been helping me cook a lot. I think they're, they're learning a lot. So this will ultimately, if we can stick with these habits, we'll actually have a healthier society because eating out and eating fast food is not good for us, even though it's good for the economy, it's not good for our health. So maybe we'll be making home cooked recipes more and maybe even calling our grandmas more to get those recipes that we remember from our childhood. Absolutely. What types of internships uh, or entry level positions are available for our Middlebury students in, in during, you know, next summer or even during this summer? Mm -hmm. um, and, and for our graduating seniors? Mm -hmm. Well, um, as I mentioned, the field of public health and global health, um, those fields are um, completely interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. So there's lots of room for students to engage with the work using skills and interests that they already have. And um, I often, um, in part because I, I used to do this kind of work myself, but I often recommend to students that a great starting place is working with data and doing research and, um, at, you know, analyzing research and communicating that out. And liberal arts graduates are really great at this. You know, our students are fantastic at researching, compiling information, making sense of it, and then writing about it beautifully. And there's a huge need for that. Public health is an evidence-based practice. 
Public health people love data. We are huge consumers of data, creators of data, analysts of data. And as I mentioned, we need science and information to guide policy. So liberal arts graduates um, are great at those tasks. And there's a lot of entry level jobs um, that utilize those skill sets. And the employers who um, have jobs like that really vary. There's um, university, you know, grant funded research work, lots of consulting companies. And when I say consulting to students, sometimes, you know, they kind of, they, they're like, not that, because they think it means something financial. But, um, you know, whenever, if, if UNICEF wants to carry out a health prom promotion project, then they typically are hiring consulting firms to carry out that work you know, multiple layers of contractors, subcontractors. So there's a lot of consulting work um, or also local or state departments of public health all create data and analyze data and use it to make decisions. So those are great jobs, but not all students like to work with data. Um, and then I always remind them when they say that, that there's many different types of data and ethnographic data is also incredibly important and ethnographic research is enjoying a real resurgence in public health and global health. Um, you know, to get at those reasons about why people don't engage in, in health promoting behaviors, for instance, that's really requires ethnographic work. And, and then there's also um, just, you know, for people who really don't want anything to do with data, there's great work to be done at the community level on health promotion you know, working with um, local nonprofits around violence prevention or serving people with disabilities. You know, there's many different ways to engage, but students do need to remember that um, right out of college, you know, they, they should be looking for an entry level job and that that's okay. And that um, I always tell students, you know, all you need to do is just get your first job out of college you know, not the definitive job of your life, or you can't fast forward to be the, you know, chancellor of the exchequer, you have to start someplace. And there's lots of great places to start where then, you know, students can find out what do they like to do and what do they want to learn more about and what do they like or not like about an organization. And I also like to remind students that you actually learn a lot more from a job that you don't like than one that you do like. It's really important to find out what you don't want to put up with or you know what types of organizations um you want to be a part of or you know what sort of management style you you like to work with so finding out you know those tough lessons along the way that's all money in the bank for a great job later is a graduate degree such as a master's in public health uh, necessary to grow in the field um, it is to get to any position of leadership or management, it's pretty important to have some kind of graduate degree. Um, and a master's in public health is a, a terminal degree and is an MPH is, is widely recognized around the world. Like everybody understands what that degree means, but it's certainly not the only graduate degree to work in the field. Masters of Public Administration, Masters of Public Policy are also great, or Master of Science are also great, Master's degrees. Um, but then there's also, there's really lots of different degrees. I mean, my professors in public health school, they had PhDs in economics, PhDs in statistics, um, maybe a Master's of Social Work, um, a JD, you know, because it, again, public health is an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary field. So um, it calls upon many different disciplines. So for instance, if a student, you know, loves economics and they ultimately want to work in health economics, they can go get a PhD in economics and then through their research and their scholarship, they can end up working in public health. And that's true of many other degree programs as well. Um, and I also just want to make a distinction now, if I may, about public health versus global health. And global health um, is 
the term that's um, more often used at liberal arts institutions that, that have an academic program, but 90, 95% of global health is the exact same thing as public health. It's about population health. It's about health promotion at a local level. But the global layer is um, sort of looking at the way that, for instance, diseases cross borders or the way that political economy affects health. And also it looks at the role of global governance through the World Health Organization, the United Nations, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund to set policy and objectives and how those uh, policy goals and how they're operationalized end up creating either the intended impacts or perhaps un unexpected impacts. So I just want to make that clarification as well. So students don't have to decide, oh, I want to study public health or global health because it's really the same thing. It just depends on what part of the process you want to look at and engage with. I wanted to ask you about your previous career before you arrived at Middlebury. You were an epidemiologist. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what your work was like and uh, what, you know, what you did? Sure. Um, so, well, before, before I even had that job, I always, I was a big quantitative person. I loved biostatistics. I loved epidemiology, you know, statistical programming. And that's what ultimately got me the job as an epidemiologist, because um, the unit that I joined, the infectious disease um, unit at the Vermont Department of Health, was mostly staffed by nurse epidemiologists who would do case investigations for reportable conditions. But starting in the late 1990s, there was a push, um, actually based on intelligence findings, there was a push for states to prepare for um, biological terrorism. And the way that you prepare for that is by launching a syndromic surveillance system that's constantly monitoring the background noise of emergency department visits and then analyzing those visits. And it's all anonymized data, of course, but it's analyzing those visits for unusual clusters of signs and symptoms that may indicate a public health emergency in the making. And it could be an act of bioterrorism or even just an emerging infectious disease or possibly even a foodborne outbreak. But the idea of these syndromic surveillance systems is that with a biological agent, you have to identify a cluster and start investigating before you even have laboratory results. Because if you don't intervene right away, a potentially curable um, illness could become fatal. So something like anthrax, for instance. Um, you need to catch right away. And the early symptoms present like flu. So people don't realize that they're infected. So that's what the field of syndromic surveillance is about. So I got that job in June of 2001. And um, all my friends were saying to me, well, this, this job is crazy. Like, why are we preparing, preparing for biological terrorism? I can't believe my tax dollars paying for your salary. Then a few months later, we had 9-11 and then the anthrax attacks. And then those same friends were like, you should be working harder, you know, because there was an actual act of biological terrorism. Um, so then the job after 9-11 and the anthrax attacks was understandably incredibly busy for a very long time. So I built up the syndromic surveillance system, which was basically... I wrote a lot of statistical programs and worked with hospitals to receive their data electronically and process it all automatically and create charts and do statistical tests on it and then create a report every day. Um, so I built up those systems fairly quickly and also, of course, in cooperation with Centers for Disease Control Guidance. Um, and then we also then had to move to a higher level of state preparedness in general. So I joined a task force of people and we did a lot of trainings around the state around responding to incidents of biological terrorism or chemical incidents or radiological incidents. So I worked with, for instance, um, the fire academy, the FBI, the local office 
the hazmat team, um, the uh, Vermont Homeland Security Unit, because um, the anthrax attacks created a situation where public health and law enforcement had to work together closely for the first time ever. I mean, we never really used to work with law enforcement, but now every white powder incident um, had to have law enforcement response because of chain of custody, which I can, I can explain if you want me to, but anyway, law enforcement has to be the one to arrive at the scene and do the risk assessment and collect a specimen that then public health tests, and then we manage the exposed people. So in 2001, law enforcement and public health were sort of thrown together into this mix, and we had to work out how to work together, what sort of protocols do we need. And then we realized that there was a strong need for training for um, first responders to understand public health emergencies and what their role was and how they might be exposed and how they might be protected in different situations. So that kept me busy for a really long time. And then, um, you know, just basically building up the syndromic system. And then along the way, of course, there's foodborne outbreaks and there's different environmental hazards. So it's, um, and then we also had the 2009 pandemic influenza. So my job was to refine that system and use its um, products to guide policy for state level public health. So that's what I did for 10 years. It was a pleasure meeting you and interviewing you, Pam. Um, thank you so much. And uh, for our viewers, uh, we will continue the series uh, interviewing different people and positions uh, that Pam mentioned today um, on a weekly basis. So thank you so much for joining us today.